All right, here's another fun lecture capture. Epistasis. Hee-haw! Recessive, dominant, or duplicate recessive epistasis. Also known in other textbooks as complementary gene action. So let's go through these, people. All right, epistasis. One gene's allele masks the phenotype of another gene's allele. What does this sound similar to? Something masking another. Hmm, that sounds like complete dominance to me. But what is complete dominance? Complete dominance is one allele masking another allele of same gene. Right? Epistasis is one gene's allele masking the phenotype of another gene's allele. So a gene interaction. Hmm, that's what all these... Uh, extensions in, in this end of this chapter is dealing with genes affecting other genes. So one gene allele masking the phenotype of another gene allele. What the hell does that mean? Well, let's walk through these, okay? Here's the definition. Let's do each. Recessive epistasis. We are going to use coat color and laboratory retrievers as our example. We also have this crazy Bombay phenotype in the ABO blood groups. You can go ahead and look that up. It should be in our book or someplace else if you're interested. But our main pattern that we're looking for is a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 4 in the F2. Again, have we seen this ratio in any other examples that we've talked about? No, this is the pattern you're looking for in the F2. One trait, okay? All of these are based on genotypes 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 of two genes, because that's what we're talking about, but what the phenotype looks like changes, not the genotypes. Okay, so if we have a parental, if we have a true breeding yellow lab and a true breeding black lab, remember two genes contributing to one trait, the trait being coat color, right? What color is their fur? Yellow, black. In the F1, we get all black, okay? From here, we don't know diddly. This could be complete dominance, just a regular old um, one gene trait, right? Can't tell anything just from the P to the F1. How about our F1 to F2? Remember, all of these come out in the F2. If you were just told F1, you don't know squat. Okay. Here's our F2. We get three different phenotypes. The black guy, a chocolate guy, and a yellow. This could look like incomplete dominance, right? This guy, if it were a one gene trait, would be the heterozygote. Looks like neither. But look, the ratios are wrong. Now I hope you guys are doing the homework problems, and if you haven't done them, you're going to do them soon, because you're not always just going to be given 9 to 3 to 4 you might be given numbers, and then you need to convert those numbers into the ratios. Okay, so mm, make sure you know how to do that. Make sure you practice the problem. Okay, so the ratio is wrong. What would it be if it were incomplete dominance in the F2? 1 to 2 to 1. It's not. 9 to 3 to 4 is not even close to 1 to 2 to 1. Okay, so it has to be something else. In this case, this pattern, 9 to 3 to 4 is recessive epistasis. Okay, so you see that pattern, boom, you call it recessive epistasis. But what we also need to understand is what does this mean? So here's the Punnett square, and as you can see, the genotypes don't change. It's exactly what we do if it were a regular dihybrid, right? We get a 9 group with the double dominant, a three group, recessive and one, at least one dominant, the other three group, the other dominant, the other recessive, and then the big loser, right? But in this case, these two guys are the same phenotype. In this case, these guys are the yellow labs. This guy is the chocolate, right? And they call it brown and golden. These people are idiots. We all know it's a chocolate lab, and a yellow lab, brown and golden. <laughs> and then, of course, the nine, double dominant, is black. 
So what does this mean? Epistasis again means one gene's alleles masking another one. If this one looks like the double recessive big loser, that must mean any time we have the two little E's, regardless of what's going on at this other allele, it wins and they look yellow, right? Little b, little b doesn't matter because over here it's yellow, here it's chocolate because it's got the big E. If it's a big B and little E's, it's golden. If it's a little B's, little E's, it's golden. If it has one of each dominant, it looks black. That's recessive epistasis. These guys in the recessive form mask what's happening at this other allele. Again, two genes, one phenotype, coat color, but we call it recessive epistasis because remember, if it were just two genes, one phenotype, the one we talked about in the other lecture capture, we'd still get nine to three to three to one ratio, right? Did we get nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio? No, we got a four here. That's not nine to three to three to one, it's nine to three to four, right? Right. Okay. How does this work? How does recessive epistasis work? Well, in this case, the two genes contribute to the coat color in dogs because one is the actual pigment and the other is actually sticking the pigment into the hair shaft. Okay, so the pigment production is gene B, as shown here. Right, gene B is pigment, pig and gene E is sticking it into the shaft. <laughs> Getting the shaft. Okay. So if you're a nine category, you have an active pigment. Yes, you make the dark pigment. And yes, you put it into the hair shaft. So look, you get black. Okay. So totally into the shaft. Looks great. You get a dark black lab. If you have no gene B or crappy pigment production, right? But you can incorporate some stuff into the hair shaft, right? You'll get this chocolate guy. So, right, this pigment isn't the only one incorporated. There's other pigments made elsewhere. So none of the black pigment gets added, but we make brown or chocolate pigment elsewhere, and that one can get incorporated because gene E is in charge of putting pigment into the shaft, right? If this other, we'll call this brown, whatever, gene C, okay? Here, it doesn't matter if gene C is also made, right? If we're putting the brown and the black in, it's still gonna look black. There's really no difference between black and black with brown. They all look like a black lab, okay? If, in the case we make the black pigment, we have a capital B, but we can't incorporate it, you look yellow, right? That's the, the background, okay? So not really white, and, but yellow. Again, there's other genes and other pigments involved, so it's not like an albino no pigment at all, but it, it's just the yellow working through another system, which we're not going to worry about. Again, if we have no black and then no incorporation, obviously you're still going to look yellow. Okay, and so that's why recessive epistasis works in this case. So anytime there's a mutation, right, in the putting it into the follicles, you're not going to get brown and you're not going to get black. You have to have this guy incorporating to get any of the darker pigments. You have to have both black and incorporation to get black. If you only have incorporation, you get chocolate. That's recessive epistasis. What about dominant epistasis? Dominant epistasis, as you might guess, is a dominant allele of one gene masking the action of either allele of the other gene. Gene interactions, the dominant allele. Again, a classic gene interaction, a classic F2 phenotypic ratio, remember F2, we're always talking about the F2, ends up being 12 to 3 to 1. How does that happen? One of the, the nine and one of the three categories comes together to make 12. The other one's three. 
the third guy is one. So we get three phenotypes, right? Just like we'd get for recessive epistasis, except that in this case, instead of nine to three to three to one, right, and having this guy become four, like in recessive, we pull together the nine and the three to make 12. Example is the colors in summer squash. So let's take a look at that, shall we? Okay. All right. So if you look at this cross, again, parental, homozygous, homozygous, white and green, F1, all white. This would look like a standard complete dominance. If you didn't know anything else, we'd say white is dominant, right? It's only when we move to the F2 that we can tell that no, this can't be complete dominance. What would we get in the F2 if it were complete dominance, right? If it were complete, F2 would equal three to one ratio, okay? Only two phenotypes. Do we see two phenotypes here? Uh -uh. We see three phenotypes. Cannot be a one gene trait. Has to be two genes. It's only one thing. Again, it's just color. So it's not a dye hybrid. It's not color and shape. It's just color. It has to be one of these stupid gene interactions. Immediately we need to decide which one. We see that 12 of them are white, three are yellow, and one is green. 12 to 3 to 1 immediately tells us dominant epistasis. Okay, and which gene is epistatic then, right? Which one, regardless of what the other allele has, turns them white? White is dominant, right? And so one of the dominant alleles must be epistatic. Hmm, could it be A? Is it a capital A? Is it that gene that's epistatic? Is every time there's at least one A, Right? A blank, blank, blank. Right? Does that equal white? Well, look. No, that's yellow. A cannot be the epistatic guy. The epistatic guy has to be the one where, right, as long as there's one of those, doesn't matter what's over here, that equals white. Which genotypes are those? It's the B allele, right? One big B here, we don't give a crap what's at the other one, looks white. A big B here, we don't give a crap what's at the other gene, right? The A gene looks white. The only case it looks yellow is when there's two little Bs with an A, right? It looks green if there's two little Bs and two little As. So in this case, when B is recessive, then the other gene does matter. Okay, so it can't be recessive epistasis looking at this, or these two would be the same phenotype. These two would be different. Okay, so you just need to think through these and determine what pattern you see and understanding how these phenotypes arise. Now, if you guys are still struggling with 9 to 3, then you're in trouble. If you're struggling with this, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, and you still don't know or understand, oh, I can't write, if you still don't understand that the nine category is the double dominant, along with whatever other allele for each, the three category, right, is one dominant, one recessive, the other three is recessive, one dominant, and the one is AABB. If you're struggling with this, you're in big, big trouble. All of these interactions are based on this. This you need to know cold. Cold, 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 cold. Pattern, 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 pattern. Make it happen. Get on your horse, people. Exactly. All right. I'm going to have you answer this question. You're going to screenshot and upload under squash as 8.1 in tomorrow's date, the 17th. I need you to answer which gene, Y or, 
sorry, W or Y, which one is epistatic? Fill out this chart, genotype and phenotype. Understand the molecular reasons for why these turn out to be these phenotypes. Again, then do a screenshot, do an upload. Okay, We're, after you get that done, hit pause, okay, do that, do the upload, then go back and finish this lecture. This lecture, again, we're going to talk about duplicate recessive epistasis. Again, it has a classic F2 phenotypic ratio. The F2 phenotypic ratio is 9 to 7. Okay, so let's take a look at this. The bottom line is they must have a dominant allele in both genes to result in a phenotype. Okay, so what does that mean? has to look like this in order to give you the phenotype. In this case, the color, purple, or whatever the example is. All the other ones, the 331, right? A. <laughs> These guys all together, ooh, look that equals 7. <gasps> 9 to 7 ratio. These guys would all be white or albino or no pigment, whatever. Let's take a look. Okay. If we, again, parental, homo times homo, purple. Huh. Does this look like anything else we've ever seen before? No. This is a whole new pattern. This one's easy. This one we can actually see from the P to the F1. Have we ever taken two of the same color, two of the same phenotype thing, cross it, and get something else out of the F1? Nope. So we could essentially call it right here without even looking at the F2 if you memorized it. Complementary gene action, duplicate recessive epistasis, whatever you want to call it. But let's look at the F2 just so we can understand the process. And here we go. Here's the F2. Both of these have to be here to see the pigment, the purple pigment. So again, right, the F1 shows it because it's always the hetero. Always dominant for one, recessive, dominant for the other, recessive. All of these guys do not have both a big A and a big B. They either have one or the other or none. So none of those are going to show the pigment. So in this case, the molecular explanation for that is, right, your colorless precursor must be transformed into another precursor, which happens to have no pigment, right? If you have this enzyme, you change to another precursor. If you have this enzyme, that guy turns into purple, okay? If you just have allele B, but you don't have allele A, you still have this precursor. Allele B enzyme can't do diddly squat to that guy. Why? Because enzymes are very specific. They can catalyze one single reaction. Allele B catalyzes this guy to turn into this guy. Allele A, this guy to turn into this guy. A can't do, <laughs> A can't do B's job, and B can't do A's job. So that's how you get this 9 to 7. Look for the pattern. Duplicate recessive epistasis. Here's another example. This is the snails. Please look through this. Make sure this makes sense. It's exactly the same idea, right? Get this in your head. You can make a Punnett square. You can fill out your phenotypes and genotypes, right? Make sure you can do these and you understand it. Okay, we're going to skip this because it's way too complicated. Feel free to read it in the book because it's totally cool, but because our brains are full. And that's the end of this lecture capture. There'll be one more. Good luck, and thanks for listening.